Enact. This is our series. This has been our third installment. The goal of this series is to know who we are as a church and what we do. I think it's good at least once a year that each one of us get to have a grasp of the vision and the mission that God has given our church. I said the last two weeks that every organization, every institution, every corporation, every entity, every club has a sense, a mission, set of mission and values, the reason why they exist. How many of you here, you're an employee? An employee, you work for a company, you work for a restaurant, some of you are business owners, you know what I'm talking about, that if you're an employee working for a certain company or you have your own business, you have a set of mission and values. You have a set of reason why you exist. And that's what you call the mission and the vision. And it's the same thing with church. It's the same thing with this organization that Christ built, the church, his church. There is a sense of mission, a sense of identity, and that's the reason why we exist in the first place. It's good for us to be able at least once a year uh, discover it. Some of you, you and your wife or your family probably have been exploring, praying about it. Is this the spiritual family or the church community that God is willing to put me in or connect me in? That's good. This is a good opportunity for you at least to receive a little bit of affirmation if this is the church community that God has for you. Or if you've been here, you're, you consider yourself as a member of Victory and you've been here forever, but yet you haven't discovered it fully what we do as a church, then it's also a good time. So whatever spectrum or air arena you're in, whether you're exploring now or you've been here considering church, this victory as your church community, this is a good time for you. Who we are and what we do. Last week, we talked about that one of our mission as a church is to be socially responsible. God has given us the calling to be a blessing to the underprivileged. To, be, to the poor and to the needy, that we just don't set them aside and leave it to the NGOs and other organizations that specialize on it. But God has given us a calling to be a blessing to the community, social responsibility, compassionate, being compassionate to the poor and to the needy. We talked about that. That's one of our missions as a church. But today, I want us to understand that one of the important missions that God has given us is to disciple the next generation. God has given us a stewardship, a responsibility to be able to disciple and reach the young people. Now, when I say the young people, I'm talking about the college students, the high school students, the grade school students, even your kids. God has given us to disciple the calling, the responsibility to reach the next generation. I am scared. I can't imagine a church that's boring to young people. The present generation, we're experiencing a revival. But it's hard to imagine. I cannot accept the truth that MTV is winning the young people. Other musicians and artists, they're winning and attracting the next generation. And the church is losing its grip on the young. When you look at the scripture, that's not how it's supposed to be. God has given us a vision and a and the, the responsibility and the power and the opportunity to be able to reach out to the young. That's why if you notice in our service, it's kind of loud. You notice it? Especially if you attended the Ignite conference, some people wear earplugs. But if you notice, some of our songs are, yeah, some we, sometimes we sing hymns, and I love hymns. But if you notice, some beats are not as friendly to the present or to the seasoned one, it's okay, <laughs> or to the fermented one. <laughs> but it's more friendly to the young. Why do we do that? Because don't, we don't want to lose our edge on reaching the young people. God has given the church the mandate to disciple them. Why? That's a good reason. Why? Why do we need to disciple the next generation? So one major reason a, ne a campus minister will be speaking next week so he'll expound on it. But there's one, here's one major reason why we need to reach and disciple the next generation because they are the future leaders. They are the future leaders of this nation. Your kids, the teenagers here, they're the ones who will continue the work of God. You'll never know. We might have phase five. Let the, let the next generation continue that. Every nation building phase five, the content, the, as we go on to the nations of the world, the next generation will continue that. 
even in the government, future teachers, future businessmen, these people will come from the next generation. That's why we need to disciple them. It takes one generation to change a nation. It takes one generation to change the world. Only takes one generation. Election is coming next year. How many of you are ready to vote? We exhort you to vote wisely in accordance with the leading of the Holy Spirit and according to your conscience. But let us not think that just because we put a charismatic, talented, skillful president, only one person we can experience lasting change. Of course, if you vote the right one, of course, probably there would be changes in some aspects, but lasting change, it cannot be, it's not enough for one person to do it. It takes a whole generation for us to encounter real and lasting change. This is the importance of discipling the next generation. If I said one generation, there's only one generation that can change a nation, only takes one, let me tell you this, it only takes one generation to divert a nation from the course that God has set for that specific nation. One of the saddest verses in Judges, or in the Old Testament rather, is Judges 2.10. And all that generation also were gathered to their fathers. We're talking about the generation of Moses. They died already. The generation of Joshua, they all passed away already. And remember, from that, they had an, uh, a sense of and a knowledge about God. They, they were at least following God. They knew about God. They were aware of God. But here, after those two generations passed away, it says, and there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord or the work he had done for Israel. One of the saddest verses in the scripture. The picture of Christianity is not a marathon. It's a race. You know what the picture of Christianity is? It's not just a game of endurance and persevering, although that's true. In some aspects, that's true. But you know the real picture of what Christianity is? It's actually a relay. You're running the race, but making sure you're holding that baton, right? You ever watch that in the Olympics, right? And then making sure that runner, while he's holding on that baton, at the right time, he gives that baton to someone else, and he'll run with it. That's a picture of Christianity. It's multi-generational. The present generation is experiencing God. We want to make sure we're imparting that to the next generation. We want to make sure the things we've learned as the older generation, the things we've learned and the faith and the passion for God, just like what Pastor Miko said a while ago, we're able to pass that on, the gospel of Jesus Christ, that the, how it changed you and me, we're able to pass that on to the next generation. That's how important it is. It only takes one generation to change a nation and the world. That's why it's very important for us. One of the missions that God has given us is to be able to impart that to the younger generation. So how do we disciple the next generation? It's a good question. How do we disciple them? We don't want, give, we don't want the church just giving it all up and allowing these artists and people who have different philosophies misleading the next generation. We want the church to rise up, us, to do something about it. How do we disciple them? Let's look at in Acts chapter 16. We're going to read five verses in Acts 16, short lang. And we're going to learn some principles here on how Apostle Paul discipled the next generation. It's a story of Paul and Timothy. Uh, just to give you a background, uh, we've been talking about Acts the last two weeks and how the church start, started. And if you look at the middle part of Acts, it's been growing. It's not just the Jewish people who were getting saved. It was actually the Gentiles, the non-Jewish people. And so the gospel was spreading and churches, was being, churches were being planted already in different parts of the world. We can say the world in the Roman world. And Apostle Paul is now already in the picture. He got saved. Now he's a missionary to the Gentiles. This is what happened in verse 1. It says, Paul came also to Derby and to Lystra. A disciple was there named Timothy. Now, Timothy is a young man. If you, scholars will say that Timothy here in this story was actually 16 to 18 years old. Teenager. Parang yung mga kumakanti dito kanina. And at this time, some say that 
Paul was already in his 15s. Okay? So you would see a present generation and the next generation. A, a disciple named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, so he had Christian roots. Uh, thank God Timothy's mom was a Christian. Probably had at least uh, roots or have an idea of who God is. But his father was a Greek, so hybrid. In verse 2, he was well spoken of by the brothers at Lystra and Iconium. See, the disciples, when they saw Timothy, they saw something good in Timothy. They saw uh, greatness in Timothy. Although he's young, it says there he was well spoken of. It wasn't expounded in the scripture, but if you notice, Timothy, we can, we can at least uh, just imagine or probably just stretch it a little bit further that Timothy had a leadership ability. He was probably well learned in the scriptures. He had passion for God. And so he was well spoken of. The disciples saw something different in Timothy. And that's a good question to all of us. When you see a young person wearing, let's say, a rock and roll t-shirt, or a lady who loves probably a weird music and may gothic, how do we look at them? How do we look at the young person? Because it says here, the disciples saw in that young person named Timothy, they saw something different in Timothy. He was well spoken of. The good question to all of us church is when we see young people in our church, do we see them as nuisance lang yan? Pampagulo lang yan, pastor. Di ba? Puro skateboard lang alam yan. Eh. Rock and roll music lang alam lang yan. Pabebe lang yan. Sometimes we can have that preconceived notion, that judgment against that person. And when we start entertaining that in our mind, we get to have a hard time seeing the greatness in that person. You know, how did Paul disciple Timothy? And here's one of the things we can learn also as a church. How do we disciple the next generation and not lose them to other people who can mislead them? It's to discern their leadership potential. I hope the present generation, our church, will see always something, will, will see something great in the young people. We're going to see a potential, although it hasn't been realized yet, it hasn't happened yet, but we see God will give us the eyes to see you're different. When was the last time you talked to a young person or to the parents here? When was the last time you told your teenager, you're destined for greatness? Before you enter that campus, let me tell you, you are a salt and light of the earth. You're different. You're called to be a leader. When was the last time you said that? When was the last time you spoke life and called out something great in that person's life? We need to do that. We need to do that more often. We discern their leadership potential. He was well spoken of. Speak, uh, Proverbs says, life and death are in the power of the tongue. There's life. We can speak life. Alam mo naman tayo, mga Pilipino, mga alaskador tayo, eh, ba? Our culture is sometimes, ba? We don't rarely speak words that affirm. It's not really ingrained in the Filipino culture, ba? Minsan, malakas tayo mamintas, eh. If you notice, ay, pango, ay, yak. Naku, malabo to. Anak, wag ka na. Wag na yan. Wag mo nang... Di ba, minsan ganun tayo eh. That's the culture eh. But the affirmation medyo, we're not, we haven't developed that muscle yet. Let me tell you, the church should have an atmosphere where we, where we believe in the young people. How many of you agree that your teenagers are destined for greatness? How many of you agree that your teenagers will be used by God? I remember when I was... Uh, 19 years old, I was actually part of the music team. Hard to imagine, no? <laughs> and I was 19 years old. I lost my dad back then. I was already active here in church. At that time, I lost my dad, 19 years old. So I was just a volunteer and had a little bit of friends in the youth service. One Sunday service, Pastor Steve was preaching. Pastor Steve was the one in the video, uh, the American guy. Pastor Steve was there in the Sunday service and he wanted to talk to me. I just lost my dad. I was sad. 
Ay, I'm happy already volunteering in the Sunday service or on Friday just playing and sometimes leading a small group. That's it. I was happy already. I had friends here in church. But just Pastor Steve had a burden one time in the Sunday service, so he wanted to call me. He wanted to talk to me. And after one Sunday service, Pastor Paulo was the one who talked me, told me, Pastor Steve wants to talk to you. Okay, did I make a mistake? Why will he talk to me? Okay, sasabunin ba ako yan? I was nervous. And Pastor Paolo said, just uh, walk me in front. Pastor Steve was there with the team of pastors in Victoria Gallery at that time. You know, this is what he said. And I will never forget. I was 19 years old. He said, Patrick, I just want to let you know that I see you preaching. I see you preaching to students who are in bondage. And I see you preaching the word of God and it set them free. You know, what will be your reaction if <laughs> someone told you that? You know what was my reaction? In English, I was having a hard time. So, okay na lang ako. Okay, okay, okay. It's hard to speak in English, right? So, I have a nose speed. But you know what I was thinking? I was thinking, that's impossible. I'm just a bassist. You know, Pastor, if I can have more time to talk to Pastor Steve, I said, Pastor Steve, are you dreaming? Are you, are you crazy? I don't think that's from God. You know what happened to me when I was in high school? When I was in high school, I cannot even memorize one line. When we had our speech class when I was in high school, I always get mental blocked. We were asked to recite and memorize Psalm 23, six verses only. Pag the Lord is my shepherd pa lang, I forget already. And then I hung. Talagang parang PC na naghang. In front of 40 students, man, I was sweating already. And then I cannot even continue because I forgot. You know why I forgot? Because I was so nervous. And one of my major fears when I was in high school is because I was, uh, one of my fears is fear of public speaking. And so we had another speech class. We were asked to memorize, you know, Abraham Lincoln's speech, right? Four scores and seven years ago. You know what I'm talking about, right? And that's it. That's the only time thing I memorized. I got mental block too. And so you know what? I wanted to tell Pastor Steve and he said that to me. I said, that cannot be. I, I'm afraid to speak in front of people. I cannot even memorize a line and recite it to three people. That can't be. But you know what he said? And he called some of the pastors. He called some of the pastors and they laid, laid their hands on me. And they said, we prayed they prayed for the gift of un- preaching, anointing to preach. Okay, then I was nervous already. What's going to happen? Will I get slain? Ano ba? What's going to happen? But I would never forget that because right now, 14 years after, I'm speaking the word to you. Now, it's not me. I'm not the hero here. <laughs> I think I'm thankful to the leaders that we have here in church, the culture, the atmosphere they create of em- believing in young people and having the ability to call out greatness in the lives of the young people. That includes me. I was included before. And I believe as parents, my encouragement, my exhortation for us is that we can call out, speak words of life to your children. Not only that, if you're a single professional, you have cousins who are younger than you, you have nephews and nieces, you know what? You can speak life. You can start saying, you know what? You might be different when you go to school because you're still a virgin and all your classmates already are persecuting you and mocking you. Let me tell you, you are different. You are set apart. Start speaking bold words and words that come from the mouth of God, from Scripture. We see something great in them. Discern their leadership potential. That's how we disciple the next generation. It's not part of my notes. I'm going to add since it's a little bit early. We're going to end at 12 noon, midnight. (laughs) You know why young people, and we were talking about this, you know why young people are attracted to songs of Katy Perry, Lady Gaga, and Taylor Swift? I have nothing against these artists, but just to give you a trivia, why are young people attracted to it? They... They love watching the YouTube songs. You know why? Because some of their songs are actually songs that empower young people. Ano yung sinabi ni Katy Perry? You're gonna hear me roar. 
You know what that message is? I'm going to stand strong. You can stand strong. What Lady Gaga said, you were born this way. Live it out. See, they, were, they, they know the lyrics communicate just speaking great things in you. It might be in a wrong way, but that's why young people are attracted to this artist. They, they learn. They, these artists believe in young people. They see something great among these young people, and they start. Kaya ano sinabi ni Katy Perry? Baby, you're a, you're a star. You can live like, see, you know why young people are attracted to it? Now we know. But if they only discover God's heart, if they only discover the words of God, you are set apart. Before you were born, before you were in your mother's womb, I have set you apart. See, Satan is just, Satan just imitate things from God. <laughs> Look at the scripture. And you young people, if you're here, how do you look at yourself too? That's a good question. How do you look at yourself? You're destined for great things. Don't let these people look down on you because you are young. But set an example in speech and life, in faith and purity, and so on and so forth. God has called you to be a leader. How long a year you're a high school student or a college student or a grade school student? Shy pe, no? <laughs> Come on now. Who among here, you're a high school student, college student, grade school student. I'm telling you, saksak nyo sa baga nyo to. In English, suck it to your bags. You are destined for greatness. God has called you, given you that, whatever gifting you have, God has given you a leadership potential. Might not necessarily be a preacher. You, some of you will be better than Warren Buffett. You'll be a salt and light in the government. Some of you might be a full-time staff here in church. Some of you will be going to the ends of the earth. But you're destined for greatness. God has set you apart. Verse 3. And then it says that Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him. Now, Paul met Timothy. Okay, now you would see the present generation and the next generation. Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him. And look at that. And he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those places. For they all knew that his father was Greek. But I want to emphasize for the sake of time, I want to emphasize those two words, wanted Timothy, accompany Timothy, accompany him, and took him. In short, Paul saw the potential in Timothy, in a, a young teenager. He saw the potential in that young man, and he, he took him under his wings. In short, he became a spiritual father to him. How do we disciple the next generation? We learn to father them in the faith. You know, when you look at the Facebook profile of your children, Look at their followers in Twitter, in Instagram, and all the social media. They have a lot of peers. They have followers. But very rare that they have what you call fathers. What young people need is not actually more friends. They need fathers. They need people who will father them in the faith. Just to let you know, we have youth services here from Friday to Saturday and a lot of young people come from broken families. Some come from a complete family, but a dysfunctional one. They're not being fathered in the right way. That's sad to say. We need the church, all of us, the person beside you. God has given us the calling to father them in the faith. To be a father to them, to be a mentor to them, to lead them in the right way. I like what Pastor Paulo said a while ago and he was talking to his teenager. He said, it's, being smart is different from being wise. How do we become wise? By being fathered in the right way. We all have experience here. They don't have to experience what we've experienced. We can impart that to them and be a father to them. I, I said a while ago that I lost my dad when I was 19 years old. 
And so, when I was growing up from zero to teenage years, my dad was there. At least I'm covered. He helped me navigate through life, being going through puberty and, uh, and just growing up. But what about my, medyo na ulila na ako eh. So, what, the, what about my adulthood? I was about, I'm 19, so I'm about to enter 20s and, you know, 25 and reaching, we'll reach 30s in the future. And I'm thankful here in this church that God provided spiritual fathers to me in my life. I did no longer have a biological father, but God provided a spiritual father. Pastor Rico is now a, the senior pastor in uh, Victory Galleria. He was a, my youth pastor back then. And, and the running pastor who's running now from Mindanao going up to Taiwan, <laughs> to Apari, I mentioned that to us, right, last we, Pastor Ferdy, those two spiritual fathers. I'm thankful to God for these two men who mentored me, who fathered me when I lost my dad, 19 years old, and entering adulthood years. In fact, they fathered me from the spiritual things to the most practical things or to the smallest things. Like what? How to socialize with the opposite sex. How to socialize with the opposite sex in a very wholesome way. You know, I, th- I realized, pwede pala yon. You don't have to flirt with the opposite sex. And I realized, I'm thankful to these men of God who taught me not to be a KJ, not naman to be legalistic, but to learn how to be confident in socializing with the opposite sex in a very wholesome and holy way. Not having malicious thoughts. He, they, he, this man taught me how to, how to shake hands with a person. He, once he told me that you, you, even if you talk to Zobel de Ayala, to the richest person there, or to the most, or to the poorest one, have the same confidence level that when you say, Hi, I'm Patrick, you know, Pastor Ferdy, right? Shake your hand. Shake his hand tight. And I learn and smile. Hi. And if there's no father who would taught me like that, I'll be parang, you know, yung insecure. Hello. <laughs> But I'm thankful to the men who trained me how to socialize in a godly way. I can be confident as a man. Even though I lost my dad already, there were people in my life who taught me how to talk to people, even people who are older than me, even to a pretty girl that sometimes makes me torpe. He taught me how to court. They taught me how to court a woman. They taught me how to lay down my intentions if ever I'm courting a woman already. They taught me how to propose. And you know what's more important? They taught me how to fall in love with God more. You know what? I, the, it's not really their words. It's really just their life. Pastor Ferdy will just drive. He wasn't running pa at that time. He will drive. And he just... <laughs> that's the normal... That's the norm. <laughs> He'll just be there and just sharing stories. He'll expose me. Pastor Rico too. So I've seen Pastor Rico being a single man. Wow. Look at him. Even if he's single, he can live a pure and holy life. And then now when he got married, he showed me his first house. All those things fathered me in the faith. That's why I was blessed to have my wife now because I was able to court her in a right way. Boyang Joss. To the singles here, I'm giving you a vision again. <laughs> What's more important is they imparted their faith. I wouldn't be here serving you, ladies and gentlemen, without the spiritual fathers that God gave me. My prayer for us is you'll have that too. I know the age range here in this church, in this service. You're, some of you are in your early 20s. Some of you are in your 30s. Some of you are past 40s. But there will always be someone who's old, who will be older than us. My prayer for us is that I'm not just talking about you, young people, I'm talking about now us. I pray that God will give us that. People in our lives who can mentor us, who can father us. Our application here is that you can also be a father spiritually 
father them in the faith, mentor them in the faith. If you have nephews and nieces who are younger than you, some of you are kids' church teachers here. I'm not just talking about the, the, the fathers here, the dads. I'm talking, also talking about us. The church can father the teenagers, the youth, the next generation. Verse 4. As they went. Oh, you see the progression now? A while ago, it was just Paul ministering, <laughs> visited Lystra and Derby. But now in verse 4, you would see it's no longer Paul, it's they. Now you would see multi-generational happening here. Advancing God's kingdom, ministering to people together, the young and the present generation. They went on their way through the Sydney's. They delivered to them for observance the decisions that had been reached by the apostles and elders who were in Jerusalem. That's actually the controversial thing that they had to decide on because Gentiles were getting saved already. And so they already got the decision from the apostles, an important message. And they were trying to disseminate it to the churches, to the Gentile people. But now you would see Paul allowing Timothy to help him out. The third thing is this, empower them to change the world. Empower them to change the world. Sometimes we, we can have a mindset, Oy, bata ka ba? Magpabebe ka muna dyan. Diba? Magdota ka lang. Yun lang naman. Mag-aral ka muna. Pag 40 years old ka, doon ka na mag-minister. Diba sometimes we can have that mindset? They're bench warmers now. We don't give them a platform or we don't empower them as young as they are. But let me tell you, when you look at the scripture, there are a lot of young people that God used. David was anointed to be king when he was 16, 17 years old. A lot of young people that God used so they can change the world. If you look at the influential people in Time Magazine and how they started their business, how they, what, and, or even in history on the things they invented, they were actually teenagers. And let's have that spirit here, ladies and gentlemen, that we learn to empower these young people. They can change the world. Having God on their side, they can make an impact in their campus and to the ends of the earth. Empower them to do great things for God. In verse 5, it says, So the churches were strengthened in the faith. When you see the present and the next generation working together, advancing God's kingdom, it, what the result is they were strengthened in the faith and they increased in numbers daily. You know one of the signs of a strong church? You know, we can have thousands here. But if it's full of old people, Araiko, if it's full of us, and our teenagers are getting bored, they're just outside, then we're missing something. One of the evidences of a strong church, is churches being strengthened, increasing in numbers, is we're not losing the next generation. I am glad that all of us, the present generation, we're experiencing at least a revival, people coming to church every Sunday. Thank God for that. You are important. But let us not lose sight of your teenagers in the next generation. That's how we see multi-generational principle working in the church. Let me just all stand. And I'm going to end here. But Imagine if that happened to Lester. Let's imagine and believe God it can happen to hundreds of teenagers. Can you imagine that? If that what happened to Lester, someone fathered and discipled him. If that can happen to hundreds, if that can happen to thousands, and God willing, nothing is impossible with him. How many of you believe God that can happen to millions? If the church, if we, the church, understand this understand this calling that God has given us Lord we just commit the calling that you've given us Lord as a church Lord we thank you for our founding leaders God our, our pastors of how they set this atmosphere this culture of reaching the next generation Lord God of how it empowered me of how it empowered others Lord 
And I pray that we will not lose this, Lord. We will not lose the next generation, God. Lord, that we will give us the grace, God, to be able to be influential to them. And Lord, I pray for the present generation, if we're old already, if you're a young professional, if you're no longer a student, just lift your, both your hands. I'm going to pray for us. Lord, you give us that calling. Give us this grace. This, Lord, I pray that every person here will realize it's not just the job of a pastor. It's not just the job of a campus minister. Every one of us will realize that we have that burden that we're carrying. We have cousins who are younger than us. We have nephews. We have nieces. We have relatives. We have neighbors who are younger than us. Give us opportunities where we can influence them, God. Push them to you. Inch them closer to you, God. Give us that heart to Father. Even when I, thought, when I say Father, I'm not just talking about the men. I'm talking about the women too. Lord, that they can lead other women, younger women as well, Lord. We pray for that, Lord God. Just give us that opportunity and we will not lose sight of that. Just put your hands down. I want to pray for the second group of people. If you're a student here, just lift both your hands. We want to pray for you. In fact, if you're beside these people, just stretch your hands on them, lay your hands on them if you're near them. Lord, we commit these young people to you. They are important to you. We're declaring greatness. We're speaking forth, Lord God, these men and women, they will honor you. They will be the Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's of their time, Lord. They'll be the Davids of their time. They'll be men and women after your own heart. We secure their calling, Lord. Whatever the schemes of the enemy, it will not prevail in the name of Jesus. They enter their campus. They know they're different because they have you. Lord, even when the world pushes them and forces them to live and compromise their standards, they will not do that, God. They will live a pure and holy life before you, God. Because they know, they know, even tonight, Lord, you're reminding them that you've set them apart, Lord God. And so we're praying as a church, we're asking for a covering in their lives, God. That you would secure that calling. They will not waste that, God. And they will live passionately before you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Give a big, big hand to these young people. Let me pray for us, Lord. As we get dismissed, I pray that you would bless our week this week. I pray that your righteousness, your peace, your joy be with us, Lord. Bless all the things we have to do this week. Protect us as we go home, even tonight, Lord God. We glorify you, we honor you today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Amen. You're dismissed.